talk to one another defines who we are. Hey, uh. And American English is as rich, diverse, and lively as Americans themselves. <laughs> From north to south. Under 65 is where I started, okay? East to west. <laughs> I say like Mike and dude every other word. We love to talk. Is there somebody else that I could talk to? Yeah. Uh, Dish. Tenemos el estreno de La Chica Sexy. And chew the fat. It's not a fur piece of rabbit hash. It's clear that you are what you speak. Isn't this not in my vocabulary? The word is ain't. <laughs> so butter my butt and call me a biscuit. And sit tight as we answer the burning question. Do you speak American? Do you speak American? Do you like speak American? Do you speak American? Do you speak American, dog? Do you speak American? Do you speak American? Ustedes hablan American? Do You Speak American? has been made possible in part by the National Endowment for the Humanities, promoting excellence in the humanities. Additional funding is provided by the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, the Ford Foundation, Rosalind P. Walter, and the Arthur Vining Davis Foundations. Like many Americans, I come from somewhere else. I grew up along this rugged Atlantic shore in the Canadian province of Nova Scotia. And my speech was colored by the dialect of Maritime Canada. It's one of the great family of North American Englishes. But when I moved to the U.S., I began to speak more like Americans. Words, accents, language have always fascinated me. So it was thrilling 20 years ago to work on a TV series about the English language. In our television series, The Story of English, we traced the origins of our language and how it spread around the world. That was in the 1980s, and I'm curious to see how the language has moved on since then. One thing is clearer. American English has become the dominant form of the language. So I'm setting out on a journey now to see what's happening to English in the United States. What answers do you get today when you ask, do you speak American? Our journey starts in the far northeast on a misty road in coastal Maine. Linguists who study the American language say the principal regional dialects remain strong, but some distinctive local dialects are dying out. Here, among the lobstermen in South Freeport, Maine, you can still hear the laconic, terse style that sounds so New England. But with mass communications and changes in population, many worry that the Maine way of speaking may become as scarce as lobsters. We're down about 50 or 60 percent from what we used to do really? six or eight years ago. Because the lobsters just aren't there, you mean? Or? They're not here. Something's happening. We don't know why. The lobsters decided to move on. They have they? moved. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's obvious. Would you be sad if the main way of talking kind of died out? Well, yeah, yeah I think so, probably. Uh, I'd it? like to think my kids and grandchildren talk that way, whether... People laugh at yeah. you wherever we go, <laughs> whatever. Do they, people laugh at it? They have, oh, lots of times. Uh -huh. They used to, when I was in the military, yeah. make fun of me wicked. <laughs> so how do people from around here say yes? Am. 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 Yeah. How do you spell it? A-Y-U-H. Am. Am. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. Linguistically, the way Mainers speak is part of a regional speech pattern centered on Boston. It derives from early British colonists who didn't pronounce the R at the end of words like father. Local dialects thrive when communities are isolated. 
When many outsiders move in, local speech changes. That's why Mainers fear that their dialect, with its famous ayuk, is coming to the end of the road. Hello, good morning. Yeah, how are you today? I'm fine, how are you? Good educated money to give you a job like this. <laughs> Yes, Thank sir. you. Go. Yeah. yeah. Linguists draw their own maps of North America to mark different dialect areas. To use their terms, we've started in eastern New England. We're going on to New York and Philadelphia, then west into the Midland dialect, then the northern, the southern, and on to the west. Right now, I'm in Massachusetts, and I'm short of gas. Good evening. What can Hi. I get for you? Can you fill her up with unleaded, please? Sure. When customers come from out of state like me, what do they think about your accent? I lived in Oklahoma for a short time, and I uh, had a conversation with a girl from Texas one day, and I was in the process of buying a car. She says, what are you talking about? Uh, I said, a car. A car. She says, what is a car? <laughs> I said, what's a car? I said, you know, automobile, vehicle, thing you get in and drive? She goes, oh, you mean a car? I said, no, a car. <laughs> she, That's funny. It was funny. I did. I had to go through all the different words before she understood what I was talking about. That's funny. Yeah, it was, it was a riot. With that accent, we might as well be in the heart of Boston, whose way of speaking shows no weakening. Americans consider themselves egalitarian and unsnobbish about accents, but they're full of notions about how not to speak. I'm indulging a sentimental whim to retrace a road I took many summers ago. This is the Priscilla Beach Theater, one of the oldest barn theaters in New England. Here I find actor-manager Geronimo Sands rehearsing his one-man show. Beware of respectable people, of people perfectly grammatical and proud of it, of persons who let their thinking be done. I spent one summer here as an actor. We were all young, eager, and ambitious. We did everything from sweeping the stage to playing romantic comedies. It was on this stage that I first learned that my speech was not considered correct. And the first time I stood on this stage and opened my mouth, the director, he said, what did you say? And they said, you can't talk like that. Because in Nova Scotia, you pronounce, at least I pronounced out like oat and about like a boat. And so I consciously changed it. And this is a, a wonderful sentimental stop for me because it was I, was, I was 21, and that's 52 years ago that I was here. And it was a great summer. After that summer, I drove to New York my acting ambitions fortunately died, but the city has become my home. The crackling energy of the creative forces concentrated here. The sheer American power represented make New York an enormous generator of language. The latest money jargon of Wall Street traders fresher than fresh slogans of our relentless advertising. A language that fuels the great publishing empires. From the city that never sleeps, 24-7, on TV, cable, radio, electronic media, come the words and ideas that define American culture and market it to the world. You can make a case that New York City is now the global capital of the English language. But what a language, restless, slangy, constantly changing, and ever more informal.
Many people believe that change is not only inevitable, but unstoppable. But not John Simon, the acerbic theater critic of New York Magazine. A Yugoslav immigrant himself, he speaks for many mainstream Americans who fear that if American English continues to flout the rules of syntax and grammar, it'll sow the seeds of its own destruction. Well, it has gotten worse. It's been my experience that there is no bottom. One can always sink lower and that the language can always disintegrate further. How would you describe the state of our language today? Unhealthy, poor, sad, depressing, um, and probably fairly hopeless. Jesse Scheidlauer stands for everything John Simon hates. He's the American editor of the August Oxford English Dictionary. With his dark suit, tie, and rolled up umbrella, he certainly looks the part. But you can't judge a book by its cover, for he's also the author of a scholarly history of the F word. Jesse's often in the New York Public Library looking for new usages. American English has always been inventive, but it is now globally so influential that the Oxford Dictionary needs a full-time office in New York City. Well, American English has always been, at least for the last hundred years, it's always taken great pleasure in its slang. Uh, you can find even Walt Whitman writing in praise of slang in the 19th century uh, about how wonderful it is and how poetic it is and how you know, this is the American spirit distilled into language. So when you come here, what are you, what are you looking for? We'll try to find magazines that have words in them that we think are going to be of interest, and these can be in really any field out there. What are you looking at at the moment here? Well, right now we're looking at some magazines devoted to tattooing and body piercing. There are terms for these different kinds of piercing, and there are terms for different kinds of tattoos. Uh, Blue, a music magazine, has a lot of stuff about hip-hop, which is a big influence on the language. You know, guide to zines. So, Fan magazines. Yes, well, they're just called zines nowadays. Zines nowadays, nowadays yeah. So if you find a new, a new word in one of these, one of these really lurid magazines mm -hmm. um, and you decide to put it in, does that mean that the dictionary has adopted the word and, and as it were, recognized it? No, not at all. For now, it just means that we have an example in the database. But then we have an example in Time magazine, and then we have an example in New York magazine, and now we have an example in so-and-so. And we start to think, well, okay, this is a term that started off as a very restricted subcultural thing, but now it's very widespread. And the fact that we did read something like this originally will tell us something that we wouldn't know if all we read was Newsweek. I see. Language enthusiasts tend to be either prescriptivists or descriptivists. Descriptivists like Scheidlauer and other dictionary makers are content to describe language as it changes. Prescriptivists like Simon believe you need prescribed rules to preserve language. The descriptive linguists are a curse upon their race uh, who uh, of course think that what the people say is the law. And by that they mean the majority, they mean the uneducated. I think a society in which the uneducated lead the educated by the nose is not a good society. Descriptivists deny treating uneducated usage as the law, since they label it non-standard. But they may record things like the often violent, homophobic, misogynistic lyrics of gangster rap. The result gives new currency to words like ho and bitch. Cece Cutler is an academic who has studied the appeal that hip-hop has for white suburban teenage boys. For white male teenagers who are in the process of forming their identities as, as young men, the, the urban black male represents uh, someone who, who knows how to pick up women, who knows how to handle himself on the street, who perhaps knows how to handle a weapon and can take care of himself. <laughs> this kind of way of walking or talking or dressing can give one uh, the trappings of a masculinity that doesn't perhaps exist in the safe white suburbs. 
the sort of more hardcore rappers might appeal to young men who are, are sort of afraid of young women and are in the process of trying to figure out how it is that one deals with them. So to call them bitches and hoes is, uh, is a kind of way of getting rid of that problem. Or putting away one's fear of, of those individuals. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, bitches at the party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there were, there were yeah there's, there's, more, there's been more, uh, there's more hoes recently I've noticed at underground events than there used to be. Yeah. There used to be not so many. Thank goodness for us. Man. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Can you Definitely. think of some examples of words that have crossed over from hip-hop into the mainstream? Uh, we have terms like mad as a quantifier, so you can say it's, it's mad real or mad, it's mad raining. <laughs> uh, there are terms like um, my bad to mean, oh, I just made a mistake, or um, the more colorful bling bling uh, to refer to um, expensive, um, gaudy jewelry. Any others? Okay. Uh, I think, it, well, you can use, you could say, what's up, B, <laughs> to ask how somebody is. It's not all fun. Chopsticks, hey, what's up? It's not all. Just chilling, you. It's not all my bubble. Do you guys still have exams? Aaliyah, that's cool. Black English is an obvious influence on the language of IMing, instant messaging. The Birdman. So, anything new? Birdman. You gonna do anything else this weekend? Written English has always been the preserver of standard English, but written standards are always under assault. The latest threat comes from instant messaging. How much time do you guys spend doing this? An hour and a half. An hour and a half a day. Tom, how much time do you spend doing Um, a lot. I'm, I'm multitask, so I'll be yeah. IMing, I'll be listening to music, I'll be doing my homework. So, really? Yeah. I mean, no one does caps or periods or punctuation. It's just, uh, OMG is oh my god. And this is just short for no. Like, sometimes people say G to G, which means got to go. JC, that means just chilling. And back here's lol, laugh out loud. And, and here, this means I'm going, I will, I'm a, I'm a, and then she says here, you better call me on my cell. What's up with you? I mean, what's up? It's like, you know, how you talk. So, how are you doing, honey? Written English in America has been evolving greatly over the last, certainly, 100 years, and especially the last 30 or 40 years. And nowadays, if you look at even the most formal publications, you know, things like the New Yorker or the New York Times, uh, you will see a wide variety of, of colloquial or slangy language used even in news articles. Um, people are interested in this, people speak this way and want to reflect this way in their writing. Written English has become much more informal uh, than it ever used to be. What do you say to the people like John Simon who are really angry about what they see as a serious decline in linguistic standards in this country? Well, I think they're wrong uh, and I think they're misguided. Uh, language change happens and there's nothing you can do about it. I mean, maybe change is inevitable. Maybe, maybe dying from cancer is also inevitable, but I don't think we should help it along. But casual grammar and disturbing new words aren't the only perceived threat to American English. New York has always been the great doorway for immigration. Today, you can hear Spanish spoken all around you. The practical question is whether Hispanic immigrants will adopt English as other immigrants did. In New York, as in many parts of the country, you'll find plenty of Latinos who don't speak English at all. Hello. Uh, do you speak English? No? No? Espanol? Uh, Rosa has lived here for 19 years, but speaks no English. 19 years. She says she's been too busy working. You were always... She always... Always working, yes. Uh -huh. 
American English has always borrowed from immigrant languages and been enriched by them. But is Spanish something different? Is it replacing English? Respado, and it's a dollar? One dollar? One dollar. Thank you very much. Gracias. Gracias. Thank you. Buenos dias. We'll return to the Spanish question later in our journey. But for now, I'm in search of standard American. Continuing down the eastern seaboard, we're headed for Philadelphia. Of course, the cradle of American democracy, but also, in a way, the cradle of what we now think of as the American speech. At this stage, what interests me most is the whole idea of what passes for correct or incorrect in American English. Even before America declared its independence from Britain here in Philadelphia, the two Englishes had been going their own ways. George Bernard Shaw once joked that the two nations were separated by the same language. Bill LeBoff is the director of the Atlas of North American English. What do you consider standard American? Well, most linguists recognize that there is a broadcast standard pronunciation which is not fixed, but which converges towards a pattern that is not local. And that's changed over time. It drew originally from where? From England. There was something called International English that was really modeled upon British received pronunciation. It took its form in London at the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, Americans were not all influenced by it. Only the big Tory cities, Boston, New York, Savannah, Charleston, Richmond. They adopted that oralist pronunciation whereby you say ca, not car, and store, which it shifts to stall. And that's still a pattern in England today. For me, the model of that international English standard was always FDR. He was a New Yorker who had the prestige pattern of the upper class in New York, and it was really arless. It sounded like this. To those who would not admit the possibility of the approaching storm, the past two weeks have meant the shattering of many illusions. With this rude awakening has come fear, fear bordering on panic. I do not share these fears. So you'll notice that every time the letter R comes up, unless a vowel follows, it's going to sound like this. The approaching storm. Storm. Not storm, but storm, and... I do not share these fears. But he, it's more than just the R. Uh, you notice the way he says shattering and utter good faith. So uh, the pronunciation of T-S-T in those situations, still found in Boston, uh, was again uh, modeled on the British pattern, and uh, it held right up to the end of World War II. And then, to our great astonishment, it flipped. So right after World War II, people growing up uh, in New York City and in many other cities behaved in just the opposite way. When they were careful, they pronounced their R's. And when they were not careful, just speaking casually, they stayed with their r dialect. So people wanted to sound more English before World War II and less so after World War II. We hear British people use that pattern and we love it. But it's not right for an American. Leboff believes Philadelphia shaped American speech more than any other city because it was the only East Coast city originally to pronounce its R's. And that R sound that so typifies American English migrated west. We're heading west ourselves on the train to Ohio. Ohio is the opening to what linguists call the Midland dialect. 
Midland speech lies between the varieties of the North and those of the South. For this leg of the journey, we're joined by linguist Dennis Preston. Dennis studies the strong opinions we seem to hold about what we believe is right or wrong in the speech of our fellow Americans. There's a kind of American linguistic insecurity which is very, very old. After all, we didn't invent English. There, there were the English who had a hold of it before us. And so there's a kind of lingering American insecurity that, well, maybe with English we, we don't do the very best thing. On the other hand, there's American populism and a desire not to be stuffy, not to be too correct. I've been walking around this train asking people to draw on blank maps of the United States the areas where they think people speak differently. You want to write anything on it? You know, you can. So what they sound like. They don't, like that. they don't just do dialect areas. They identify those areas where they think the least correct or the most correct English is spoken and draw circles around that. Nine times out of ten, when you ask people to do this, they go for either the U.S. South, which is almost universally believed to be a place where bad English is spoken, or New York City. But New Yorkers, you're sure of, they don't sound yeah. like Pennsylvanians. No. Right? They say water. They say what? Water. Wooda? Water. Instead of, what do you say? Water. Water. Well, that's what I say. Americans are ambivalent about language. They may think that New York and Southern accents are bad English, but they can also find them charming. I like hearing people from uh, the South. Really? Yeah. How come? Absolutely. What do they mean? I just, I just like the way they talk. I like to hear the way they talk. Let's take race out of the equation. All right. Okay. Okay. Well, if we take race out of the equation, if I go to a p place in the South where at least they are not overtly uh, uh, racist or whatever. I would tend to feel comfortable around Southerners. It makes you come, feel... Come on in here, honey. That kind of... <laughs> that, 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 yeah, it makes me feel a little more... Uh, uh, but, I mean, there's some places in the South that me as, as a black man, I'm going to be caught dead in. Oh, that no, no, that's another story, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes. So it makes no difference how they sound. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I want to make a short stopover in Pittsburgh because it shows how communities can cling to an accent as a badge of identity and local pride. I'm here to meet with a linguist who's been studying her fellow Pittsburghers' idiosyncratic way with words. She's Barbara Johnstone. How would you describe the language of Pittsburgh? Well, people talk about something they call Pittsburghese. They have this strong idea that there's a way of talking that happens here and only here or in this in this part of Pennsylvania, in this area. Here's a store that's got some interesting stuff. Shirts here with Pittsburghese on them. Old Scotch-Irish mm -hmm. words, which you can still hear in Belfast. Yeah. It's a very unusual word for me. What, first of all, what does it mean? This is a way of spelling yins, which is the plural of you. Yeah. Um, it's also often spelled with a Z at the end, which reflects more how it sounds, or sometimes yins. with a U. Yeah. Yins. Um, do, you, do you have any sense of where it came oh, from? Yeah, it's a... It's a actually a form of plural U that's found pretty widespread in Appalachia, but often it's spelled more like Ewans. 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 In the Berg, the words in and out sound more like in and odd. Down and town sound like darn and tarn. How would you say them? Starting at the top. First one. Out. Out. Opposite of in. Babushka. Headscarf used for a bad hair day. Blitzburg. Drinking town with a football team. Chip Tam, thinly sliced ham, so don't lay in the bird. Yeah. Downtown, that's where you're at now. We're at now, yeah. Downtown. Okay. Yeah. Here's the greatest. But we don't want to let the lady read this one. It's jag off. Anyone who pisses off a Pittsburgh. <laughs> <laughs> what do you have to do to piss off a Pittsburgh? Uh, just tell them to steal her sock. And I'll just tell them yeah. you're right on a good bread here. Yeah. I think I've always been interested in how people relate to places. Um, you often hear the claim these days that in the context of globalization and people moving around and places don't matter in people's lives the way they used to. And, and since I'm a linguist, I've looked at this through language. I've looked at how people use kind of shared ways of talking and shared ideas about ways of talking 
to connect themselves with places and to connect themselves with other people and communities. So Pittsburghers fierce pride in their own speech is a measure of the importance of place. I think so. This local accent, which is different from how people talk elsewhere, is available as a way of talking about place. And all the while, they're talking about who they are and where they live and what it means to live here. In a country full of linguistic variety, there's one variety that everyone sees as the norm. There's a great deal of agreement in a sort of Ohio, Michigan, northern Indiana, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania zone of uh, normal English. Even Southerners, for example, will reach right up and draw that Midwestern area and say it's normal. So, so this, is, this is where you say the kind of correct American English is spoken. That's what I would say. Yes, without an accent or a white. But what's out here? What states are there? Kansas, Missouri. Kansas, Missouri, Iowa, Nebraska. Yeah. If you took a speech class, I think that they would want you to speak more like these people here. Just Wisconsin, Michigan, Wisconsin, Michigan Minnesota. Or, uh, uh -huh. yeah, I should add Ohio. Well, it's in there. Oh, okay. Ohio, Ohio is in there. Yeah. So, they, so if you were, were studying to be a, an announcer or something, you think this is the... This is what they would... This that's is, the this target. Is, that's the target. Uh -huh. Technically, the dialect area they're talking about is called Midland. Midland is spoken in much of the Midwest. For most Americans, this is the yardstick, the most normal and correct of all dialects. And Americans are terribly concerned with correctness. A lot of people are worried about the state of the language, particularly the written language, so much so that they've set up hotlines all over the country where you can uh, call if you have questions about correct grammar. Even the last 10 years or so, they produced a directory of grammar hotlines in the US and Canada. I think I'm gonna pull over and uh, call one. Ella Lewis manages the original we hotline. Do. We get calls from Canada, we get calls from the United Nations, we've gotten calls from many law lawyers and law firms. We've even gotten a call from the White House. They would not say which branch. I see. Um, may I ask you a question myself? Oh, certainly. Go ahead. Is it getting harder to maintain the written standards or the standards in the written language, do you find? Yeah, uh, we do have troubles with the grapholect. What does that mean, grapholect? Uh, well, dialect means the way we speak. There are about 60 dialects of uh, English are on our planet, Pakistan, Nigeria, you name it. If you think about it, a person from Scotland with a brogue might not be able to communicate with a person from Texas with a drawl or with a person from Nigeria with that very clipped speech. But if we all keep to the same grapholect written rules, then we can still communicate. Some linguists question whether the written standard can guarantee universal understanding. But that's an academic issue in the practical world of newspapers. America's main city papers print millions of words of copy every day. And every one of those words will or should have been vetted by a copy editor before the edition lands on your porch. One of Ohio's leading papers is the Columbus Dispatch. Kirk Arnott, assistant managing editor, is the language watchdog. I'm a big believer in informal and conversational language. We should be as conversational as we can be because we want to be as accessible as we can be. I certainly don't want us to, to uh, sound like the paper was edited by a school marm, uh, but somebody's got to keep the language from sliding into the abyss. Without policing, it, it will tend to slide away from being a useful communication tool. Give us some examples of things that you, as the, as the language cop, have to arrest before they get out. Uh, I see a lot of words that are just downright misused. What would be some of those words that you think are misused? Importantly, 
when all they mean to say is important. More, more importantly, they say, importantly, of course, means to, to act as though you're important. Nonplussed is another one. Uh, the general attitude seems to be that it means unperturbed, when in fact it means bewildered. Um, uh, bemused is another one. Uh, people seem to think it means amused rather than also bewildered or preoccupied. Those are some of the ones that seem to be most common. The people, people who work here watch cable TV, listen to the radio, and it just it works its way into their heads. Again, the spoken is influencing the written, and newspaper copy is being affected or infected by the spoken journalism of radio and TV reporters. Not because they're bad journalists, no, but no. because their delivery is is discursive, colloquial, spoken speech, and not um, right. and not written. And it's a different discipline it is, of writing. It certainly it? is different. Oh yes, you just have to know how to pronounce the words. Yeah. No offense. <laughs> well, <laughs> I take none. <laughs> All over the country, big city newspapers work hard to uphold standards for written English. While the language we speak on the streets of our cities is by its very nature changeable and shifting. For decades, Bill LeBoff and his colleagues have been studying how Americans talk. The result is a whole library of recorded voices and a fascinating discovery. It's called the Northern City's Vowel Shift. Leboff believes there's a revolutionary shift in the pronunciation of short vowels that have been relatively stable for a thousand years. What we'll be looking at is this mass of cities around the Great Lakes. Uh, here we have Syracuse, Rochester, Buffalo, and Cleveland, Detroit. How many people is that? It's about 34 million people. This area used to be the closest to network pronunciation. It was what the NBC standard was based on. And today, uh, it is moving further and further away. Let's go into that in some detail. Let's show us how that's happening. In these experiments, we played, first of all, an individual word. Black. And then people had to write down what they thought they heard. So you can do that yourself. What do you hear? Black. Right. And then, in another series, they heard... Living on one black. Now what do you hear? Block. Well, you change your mind and... Old senior citizens living on one block. This person is saying the word block the way they say black. So we can the shift this in this one vowel seems to have a domino effect on the other four vowels, here. and they all change too. The result can be serious misunderstandings. Now, this is spectacular. Bosses. Everybody writes down what? Bosses. Right. The guy. Yeah. The bosses with the antennas. And now you begin to wonder, wonder what right. are these the bosses, bosses with the, the antenna. antennas right. that are carrying? I can remember vaguely when we had the bosses with the antennas on the top. So bosses has become bosses. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. Uh, and so this is very hard for most people to recognize. So is it fair to say that North Americans are in different regions, are going, growing further apart from each other linguistically? It seems so. It's hard to believe everyone says to us, we all watch the same radio and television. How can that be? It's a very surprising finding. In the 1960s, Detroit was the home of Motown. Today, there's a thriving hip-hop scene. Even the white crossover rapper Eminem comes from the area called Eight Mile. Inner city Detroit is 82% African American. But language can define you just as much as the color of your skin. At the main bus station, we meet John Baugh, a professor of linguistics from Stanford University in California. John joins us in Detroit to demonstrate an experiment he's been conducting for years about how Americans react to different accents. It's called linguistic profiling. First, he checks the rental housing section in the city paper. Then he calls properties that are advertised for rent. 
He calls first using an African-American accent. Yes, my name is Michael Davis. I was calling to see if you might have any houses for rent that might be available. Then he calls again, speaking with a Latino accent. Hello, this is Juan Ramirez. I'm calling about the apartment you have advertised in the paper. Yes. All right. Finally, he calls in a perfectly neutral American accent, which is, in fact, how he really talks. What kind of results have you been getting today? I've actually been getting some mixed results today, but generally speaking, the minority dialects do not fare as well, and particularly in the affluent communities. Is that race or economic class? It's both. Race in and of itself will not be the factor that excludes one from a particular neighborhood or a house for sale in an affluent community. Linguists like Baugh believed such prejudice shows ignorance of black history and language. That history is celebrated in this African-American museum. The stories of slavery and black English are inextricably linked. It's often assumed by blacks as well as whites that African-Americans speak bad or lazy English. In fact, black English has roots as deep and a grammar as consistent as Scottish, Irish, or any other of the Englishes spoken around the world. It was the dreadful traffic in human lives that brought English to the coast of Africa. British and American slavers trading upriver introduced the English language to the African middlemen from whom they bought the slaves. 20 years ago, when we filmed our TV series, The Story of English, we went to an upriver trading post in Sierra Leone. 300 years ago, blacks and whites communicated with a simplified English known as pidgin. The contemporary African-American dialects all grew from the trade languages that evolved from slavery. The language mixing that took place between the African languages and English on the west coast of Africa for trading purposes still function today. This Anglo-African mixture is still a lingua franca on this river. River trade carried it down to the coast and slave depots. This is Bunts Island. The ruins of an old slave fort still stand here. To prevent revolts, traders made sure the slaves penned up here spoke different languages. To talk to each other, the slaves created their own pigeon. So even before they left Africa, they were speaking in English that was all their own. And so the slave factories and these trading languages that you've illustrated here are the very origins of contemporary African-American English. Twenty years ago, when we filmed off the coast of South Carolina, you could still hear the faint whispers of slave English. On the islands of Kiowa, Edisto, Dafoski, and Watermala, older people like Benjamin Blygan and his sister Janie Hunter still spoke Gala and Gichi. All of these three of the Madison. Yeah. We just sit down and eat Madison right yeah, now. Yeah. All of them is Madison. Yeah. I'm looking at Madison every day. Yeah. All of us are good, time, good, good, good time, time. Good time. Good time. Yeah. Their time stood there right now. Yeah. But they, they just don't want to own it. Uh, but I still old time, you know, I keep my old time here. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, nothing yeah. like it. Give me the old time religion. Give me that old time religion. When rural southern blacks eventually moved to the cities of the north, they brought their own kind of English with them. They're young men now, but 25 years ago, Duane, Asheen, and Keeley were students at this school. Situated in a prosperous, mostly white suburb of Ann Arbor, there were not many black kids at the Martin Luther King School. 
When they spoke, as they did at home, in African-American English, their teachers simply assumed they couldn't do schoolwork. They sort of felt like we were unteachable in a sense, I will feel. So I kind of made them go towards other students more and gave them a little bit more help than they would give us. Can you remember some of the things that were said, teachers would say? Actually, um, to be honest, the teachers really didn't even communicate with us too much. It just was sort of like a sense that we were on our own. Do you remember any of that? You were younger. I was real young, but I mean, I remember enough to know that I wasn't being treated the same way as all the other kids in the class or a lot of the other kids, you know, that's the irony of it all. It's Martin Luther King school and, you know, they haven't learned anything from Martin Luther King. Well, hopefully they learned it, but they didn't learn it back then. Three mothers refused to accept second best for their sons. Annie, what was it that got you and other parents upset enough to bring a lawsuit against the school? Um, my kids was tested and was tested and was put into special ed classes, and I felt like that they were not getting educated and was not treated equally, and I felt like that shouldn't be a barrier because of a language to stop them from being educated. Ruth Zweifler is a social worker familiar with the housing project the boys came from. Listening to Annie tell how her son and his friends were failing at school, she knew something was wrong. There were maybe 24 black, poor black children in a sea of affluent white families, and they really were having a very hard time. Ruth became convinced that the kids were being discriminated against because of their African-American English. Language is the marker for assumed attitudes coming with an implied criticism, which is what I think a black child carries with them. We as adults, as mainstream society, as Americans, have really done bad by these little kids. Hi, Ruth. Hey. How are you? How good to see you. Good. Unable to make any headway with the school administrators, Ruth went to Detroit. One of the lawyers she consulted was Ken Lewis. The legal strategy they and others thrashed out led to a landmark court decision on black English. Our job was to see if we could come up with some legal theories that made sense that we could pursue on their behalf. The initial thrust of the case was to deal with the children's poverty as the reason why they were not being educated. There is really no constitutional right not to be poor in this country, and so trying to find some constitutional provision that would help us along those lines was a futile effort. So language became a part of it, and since that language barriers seemed to impact adversely only on black youngsters, we were able to tie in the race issue. The most significant thing that I believe was raised during that trial was that you had a federal judge acknowledge formally that African-American vernacular English represented a significant linguistic barrier to academic achievement and success. He confirmed that the school district was really insensitive to the linguistic background of the vast majority of African-American students within the school district. Years later, the argument Ken Lewis used in this courthouse was raised by educators in Oakland, California. But they claim black English, which they called Ebonics, was a separate language. That caused a national storm, and as we'll see, it's an issue school boards are still grappling with. One of the things that I remember Judge Joyner indicating in his opinion was the need to help youngsters appreciate the difference between the language of the majority, how it would impact upon your being perceived by others. That was part of the discussion we had to wrestle with in the black English case because we thought that the teachers were not respecting the language as it should have been. If a young black who talked like Puff Daddy applied for a job in this law firm, <laughs> would he get it? The reality is he has to fit the criteria, the skills that are required for this particular job. Just like if I wanted to go on the radio and become 
the commentator for the R&B rap hip hop station, I'm going to have to change my language skills because I got a, a different audience I'm appealed to. I'm wrestling with it now with my own 15 year old who, you know, communicates to me in language that I'm not necessarily sure I understand. But I'm, I'm working on it. I'm, I'm, I'm finding that I'm coming full circle with this thing called black English. <laughs> This is the hip-hop crew, Athletic Mike League. Some are college kids who can talk standard American, but among themselves, they speak street talk. In language, as in music and fashion, it's the street that influences the mainstream. Everything follows the streets in, in America, so... Whatever's going on there, it goes from here to here, then eventually mainstream America, which is, you know, which is white America. Before they go on stage, the crew rehearse bits of their routine. Y'all done slipped and messed up and let West flip his wig in the rhythm section. It's that live feeling transcendence. Classic features of urban black English include we going instead of we are going. He start instead of he starts. And we be going for a habitual action. But another characteristic of black English is its love of playing with words. Spinning new meanings out of words like stacked, live, vibing, sick and ill. Coming down, I'm edgy about what I'm about to walk into. I hope the place is stacked. I hope that the audience is live. I hope when I step out this door that they are ready and anxious, you know, to hear us do what we gotta do. They gonna feel us, or they gonna connect with us. Y'all gotta represent up here for the mic, please. Y'all can't be back here. You gotta come out there confident. For me, it's almost on the borderline of being cocky. You get on stage, and all of a sudden, you've got that connection, you're vibing. This whole game is just a, it's based on how ill you are for how sick a cat can be. Sometimes it's about finesse, sometimes we're just on there spitting and just, and just trying to be as raw as we can be on stage. And so you have to rock as hard as you can. So you, you're recognized as the best. You gotta look, listen, move, and yeah, really feel it. And that's, that's when we, that's how we could judge crowds. Other people will judge a crowd differently. These hip-hop artists draw on local street talk for their lyrics and poetry. We use the word nasty for everything. And when somebody was on, on stage and they were really, you know, they were really getting off, they were rocking the crowd. He was like, he was nasty, his flow is nasty. <laughs> We have the same pro nasty, professionally nasty. It means it's quality. This yeah. is this is this is not just good. That's our grade this A. Is, That's this our is, this is the top. That's our professional grade. If you want the best and you want the top, you want something from us that's pro nasty. Nasty, pro nasty, sick and raw. Hip hop and rap are forcing new meanings into American English. And if you've never heard these words used like this before. You probably will soon. Next time on Do You Speak American? Mosey on down to the heart of the South. Down home where I'm from, Tennessee and Kentucky both, they claim me. Uh -huh. Tennessee claims I'm from Kentucky, and Kentucky claims I'm from Tennessee. <laughs> Here, you can sample some spicy Cajun. Or try some straight-shooting Texas talk. His pants were so tight, if he'd have farted, it would have blowed his boots off. <laughs> so saddle on up. It's a journey like no other. 
next time on Do You Speak American? For the down low, the skinny, and the 411 on how you speak American, visit us at pbs.org. While you're there, get tips for starting your own PBS program club so you can continue to speak American with your friends and family. Do You Speak American is available on DVD for $69.95 or VHS for $59.95. A companion book is available for $24.95 plus shipping. To order, call 1-800-336-1917 or write to the address on your screen. Do You Speak American has been made possible in part by the National Endowment for the Humanities, promoting excellence in the humanities. Additional funding is provided by the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, the Ford Foundation, Rosalind P. Walter, and the Arthur Vining Davis Foundations. We are PBS. 